Sister Adaifi. My name is Anna Louise, and this is Rivka. And we're letting him into the Zoom. <laughs> Yes, can you hear? Can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> yes, perfect. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. We want to start off by asking you, because normally we have our guests sitting uh, in front of us on a couch. Why can't you physically be with us today in Amsterdam? Hey, slow down, slow down, slow down. Drink a cup of tea or water or whatever. First of all, let me welcome you all. Uh, formal way. It's nice to see you today. Nice to be with you today. Then let me welcome you in like a Yemeni tribal welcoming. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya hello, marhaba, rahibo, hayak, wallah. Hello, marhaba, madio. Then let me welcome you like special welcoming to Guantanamo. Is this uh, way you normally introduce people, like how you normally welcome people? In Yemeni tribe, yes, basically. The, the third one, like uh, Guantanamo welcoming, was like. Haba haba bilija bilija ya marhaba bilija so basically the, the song when people like welcome new detainees or someone came from somewhere so i would like to share this with you today answering your question why i'm not being with you today uh yeah i wish i was there <laughs> basically the problem is you know it is the extension of guantanamo policy and at the same time, you know, the restrictions we live in, and they're because the stigma of Guantanamo, you know, like I have been for the last five years fighting for my own country to get a passport with the Serbian here to get like a travel document, which no reason they give us, why not? Uh, my lawyers went five times for the last five years, more than five times, sorry, to Yemen embassy in, in Washington. I said, yeah, we are going to the passport. There's no problem. But the truth is, like in short words, we live in Guantanamo 2.0. Because living Guantanamo, that doesn't mean you are free. No, Guantanamo still hasn't lifted, uh, lift us yet and still hunting us every single day. So <laughs> uh, something we have to live with, we have to keep fighting for our freedom for justice and to stop the, the uh, this kind of nonsense. So uh, I had get a lot of invitation to go to Canada, to Germany, to United States, to UK. I published the book last year. We get a lot of to attend like some conference, some awards, but I'm not able to travel. Even I couldn't get married because the same issue. Can you, for those of us who don't know who you are already, could you maybe tell us very quickly um, what your life looked like before you were sent to Guantanamo Bay? Oh, guys, can we meet again? Like, we can like talk a lot about my life. So, basically, <laughs> the basic highlights. <laughs> yeah, basically, I am Mansour Baifi uh, from Yemen, a former Guantanamo detainee. You can call me 441 or a smiley troublemaker, whatever. So, I have a lot of, I have a lot of names. So, I came from a tribal. Uh, society, uh, concert, uh, conservative family from Yemen. I live, we live like in the highest mountain in Yemen, like literally we see, we see the, the clouds beneath us. And you can say like, I'm hyperactive because people who live in the mountain, actually they are like hyperactive people because they move a lot. They need to move a lot because the, the nature of life. When I finished my ninth grade i moved to the city because we didn't have like high school in our in our uh, area i moved to live with my aunt to finish my high school in high school i first time i saw the city it's like whoa this is crazy the lights the street the cars the buildings wow this is amazing you know i would like to stay here just just to push button in the in the wall you can see phew, light i like the tv wow <laughs> so it was an amazing memories because you look like your entire chi entire childhood and just isolated from the rest of the world. Your world is just your village, your tribe, your, you know, the things. And also my family, my, my father is the head of the tribe. So we are very disciplined because- Did it help you? Like he strives, like this feeling of already in isolation when you later moved to Guantanamo? No, it didn't because you are isolating in a way, not not me like, I'm, I'm, I mean like isolation of the rest of the world, but you ha you live in your own world, still young, but you live in like 
learning about yourself, about the tribes, you know, about the customs, everything around you. You have, you have your own life. But Guantanamo is a different story. There is no comparison. Guantanamo is a dark hole. So when I moved to the city, like, then I you know, start studying, knowing, meeting people, talking. I'm like curious. And I wanted to study uh, computer science because the first time they opened like a new private college in Yemen, like computer science. So I used to work as a security guard. Oh, by the way, I work in the Netherlands uh, embassy. The Dutch embassy. <laughs> yeah, the Dutch embassy and the German embassy in Yemen. And they have like really nice people. And so I wanted like, you know, at that time, the technology at that time in Yemen, like Yemen also at the same time, our education system, it wasn't that developed. Even until now, it's worse. So now I'm working in my thesis, reforming Yemeni education system. It's my third degree. <laughs> So I was like fascinated by the computer, by the, you know, the, the stuff I see, like the TV, the small, the, the small like Walkman, like I, I, I save money, I bought one, like tried to like always go to electronic stores to watch and like, wow. So from that, I went to study computer science, but it's a private college, it's expensive and my family cannot offer like, so person at that time, I was, I worked in, like, in one of the institutes in Yemen who was like, uh, this is how my journey started. I worked in the institute for almost like two years, studying a side about history, Arabic language, and so on. And then you went to Afghanistan, right? Because yeah, is... and from here, by the, by the end of the 1990s, there was some kind of conflict between Al Qaeda and United States. And that happened in Yemen at the same time, like you attacking US school, attacking Nairobi Dar es Salaam in Saudi Arabia, you know, back and forth. So the head of the institute, he was one of the most influential scholars in uh, Arab Peninsula. He was asked to write a book about the uh, Al-Qaeda ideology and like about the uh, new groups. But you know, at that time you didn't have a lot of resource, nothing about the group, it just it's like completely a mystery, mystery, a mysterious group. So there was no Mr. Google or Miss uh, Windows, <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> Wouldn't have even internet like, so. He uh, selected one of his students to be like, to research about this group. I was just researcher assistant. This is my, my job. I'm curious, try to help. Oh, and so the group on. you went with? Yeah, one guy, like we, okay. two of us. We also, we, we were approved by on our government and everything was, you know, like, like, because going to Afghanistan at that time wasn't like, uh, it was a problem going to Afghanistan from Yemen. Like that means you have, you will have like a problem with the, with the government. So we get approved from our own government. So when we're like this, my was my main mission to go to Afghanistan to investigate. And Afghanistan arrived there. We started doing the interviewing people, visiting places, like trying to know more, to collect like more information about those groups, about the ideology, about what they want. I mean, like everything, because to try to book, you need to have as much information as you can, and you have to have like constructive argument in order to dismantle any kind of uh, ideology. It's not just you have to come from presumptions and and try to dismantle it, like build it and dismantle it. That doesn't, that had how uh, the things work. So at that time, like when I arrived in Afghanistan, it was like almost, you go back literally 1000 years. The only thing that connected to the modern world, motorcycles and moving cars. Other than this, the buildings, the people, the clothing, everything you feel like, when you read about the, the mid uh, centuries, you can see the hardship of in people's life, in people face, the hardship of life on, on the people's face. You could see the scars of the war that left behind, like, uh, the, like the, 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 the tanks, the trucks, the damaged buildings, the, the bad economy, the poverty, you know, and so on. Like, it was, it was really sad. So we started from there, but it, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy task because even there we were also under scope. People, why are you doing this? Are you spying? Are you trying like, no, we would like try to come to be like, no, we're just doing. So we started doing this until like 9 11 happened. We, because in Afghanistan, you almost say isolated from the world. There's no TVs, no any kind of like newspaper or something. One day we, we, when we were in the restaurant, we heard that. It was like an attack on an um, American uh, building by planes. 9-11. 9-11, basically. And honestly, we didn't give much attention, you know, because you live in a different world. You feel you live in a different period of time. 
then th things come uh, come when like when we in Afghanistan we were staying one of the Saudi uh, charity organization who doing some charity work there. The head of the charity organization told us, "You need to move because he got an instruction from Saudi Arabia that uh, he need to close to uh, liquid everything and he need to move from that place because this is a big problem." I said, "Okay, uh, we stay because all the time we stay with the. They were like our point contact, stay in Afghanistan with them and so on because they were also one of the charity organized with Saudi Arabia. They were also doing some kind of like intelligence work for the Saudi government at the same time because everyone they have their own interest." I realized that late, later. <laughs> then from there, one the, the the guys they try when they try to look with everything. Our one of the guys who work uh, so hey he was working with the church. He said Mansoor, we have the last trip. They have to take medicine, blankets, stuff, uh, logistics like for one of the hospitals. And this our last trip. I said he said would like to come with me. I said why not? If it is the last trip, you can like leave the car and go to Pakistan, leave uh, to Yemen. I mean, exactly, we didn't know what's going on outside the world, literally, because you know, nothing connected the world. You didn't see nothing. Like, I never see, I never watched 9 11 until like 2010, literally. And our way to, when we like try to take that stuff for the, uh, the hospital, logistic stuff, we are attacked by one of the warlords, kidnapped. They took the stuff. And it's like, don't worry, don't worry. They do all this sometimes, they need interest in the car because. The car was new, blue uh, Toyota car, beautiful car. I said, like, would we'll let them take it? He said, Mansoor, just let them take it. That's matter. Like, one call, they will bring everything back because how things work in, in like those areas. But we were taken. You and your companion, the rebels. Yeah, I'm like, taken. I said, okay, you know, like, people, world lords took us. They're like, they took that. They said, we're going to deliver the medicine. And from that world lord, we were sold to another world lord. Story short, story was sold to the CIA. And we're sold to the CIA, but many people yeah. were sold to the CIA, right? We're not yes. the one. Yeah, I mean, like, we will come to that. So when I was sold to the CIA, I was surprised when they come, Americans, you know? I was like... They thought you were someone else, right? Well, here's the thing, you know, you can see 86% of the prisoners in Guantanamo were either a mistaken identity or sold for bounty money. When I'm right, when uh, when America right in Afghanistan, yeah. huh? Eighty-six percent, yeah. And you know, according to ACLU and the uh, Seattle Hall University, only twelve percent have suspicion connected to Al Qaeda and Taliban. You know, I'm not saying this my statistics or my own uh, numbers. I'm talking about the American institutes who do those research. So, who do you think you were? Like you personally, when they captured you, who did you, you know, think you were? The, uh, when I, when I, when the uh, American airplanes uh, arrived in Afghanistan, they they used to throw uh, pamphlets offering a large bounty of money if you bring people, Arabs, Al-Qaeda, Taliban. And the higher the rank you told them, the higher you get paid. So if you're like, oh, this is a regular member, $5,000. You're like, this is Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda commander. Oh, 100000 200000 So basically, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars buying those people because it was a big, a big mess, in, even in Afghanistan. And... Uh, and wait for you in Afghanistan. Hey, we are here. Please come take us. That didn't make any sense. So yeah. anyway. But you were 19 years old. I was 18 years old. 18, 19 in the black side. So basically when I taken the black side, I was sold to be Al-Qaeda. And I have like a, a notebook with like, I have like names, numbers, places. I was like, I have a camera. I have like a recording device, uh, recording uh, Walkman, like recording uh, it's not a device, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we call it Walkman. So basically, and um, they said, this is it. This is the guy, I have all the names, have numbers, have information, have questions. <laughs> and they told me, you are an Egyptian. I was told to be like Al-Qaeda commander, not an insider. <laughs> and again, they told me I was like a commander in Tora Bora. I didn't even be in Tora Bora. I was like arrested even before that. So I spent three months in the black side of our torture in the worst imagining, in the worst you could, ways you can imagine. After that, that was they transported me into like to Kandahar prison, which also was like shift uh, camp tents surrounded with barbed wires. 
I'm from there, Midi to, to Guantanamo. And every time, you know, like I thought this is this is it, this going, this one going to die, this going to going to because you know they they torture you to the to the point that you face death many, many times. Just literally, literally. So like it's hard to go through it now. It's not the point. So when I arrived at Guantanamo, I was only 19 years old and you know, from Guantanamo, from Kandahar to, to Guantanamo, it was like, I wished to die many times on the way because- Do you know where we're going? No, they never told you. Especially when I arrived in, when I arrived in Kandahar detention uh, prison, they asked me to sign a paper that if you try to escape, we're going to shoot you and kill you. I said, no, I'm not signing anything. Of course I will try to escape. And I get beaten. So, and they took my hand like, they, I said, that doesn't count. So basically, again, they like you would be interrogated by different intelligence agencies, different countries, different like German, the French, the the, the British, Arabic. It's just everyone want to have a piece of you. If like, oh, this is something. Everyone to make sure that your person or you're not that person. Everyone will look for, will look for Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda, Commander Taliban, dirty bombs, uh, wherever they, they they looking for. Uh, they didn't know what they were looking for, to be honest. What did you tell them? You know, in the black side, there is no uh, there is no answer. No, the problem. I admit to everything, but the problem was the details, which I cannot make the details that much the story because even if you don't have, if you if you if you are not that person, because. I, it was a good that traveled to Indonesia, to England, money, <laughs> money laundering. Yes, yes, but when you come to the details, and they told me, we know that you are uh, trained to counter interrogation technique, we are going to break you. You okay. spent 16 years in Guantanamo, you were 18 while they thought you were a 40 year old man, you spoke with a Yemeni accent while they thought you were Egyptian, and they thought this for 16 years long. Why do you think the interrogators and the guard were so adamant in saying that you were lying, that you were a terrorist, even when there was no evidence supporting that claim whatsoever? You know, they, in the black side, they, I think they figure out I wasn't that person they were looking for, or I will never ever leave the black side, and like, honestly. But again, when you go to Kandahar or to Guantanamo, your file would go with you, the same thing. And the, the, the cycle of the interrogation will start over and over and over again. And one of the problems, you know, the people said, uh, they uh, identify you in a uh, military uniform. I didn't been in the military in my life. And so basically when in Guantanamo, the cycle is also like my behavior in Guantanamo, when I arrived in Guantanamo, I start like behaving like as a tribe, man, and, like try to stop the torture that if I think doesn't make any sense, my older brothers try like, don't do that. They, you know, just show them that you tame. They tried to tame me. I said, no, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like, I'm not gonna do that. So I was a little stubborn too at the same time. So I was like instigating everyone, shouting, yelling, and with, the, with them fighting back. And they said, yeah, we uh, also like talking to the people, like as I used to like in the tribe, you know, that what you do when you talk, address your people. Yeah, he's, you know, like he's kind of have a way to move people. He's the way he's giving orders. I'm sure. The story in Guantanamo Bay post the war on terror was that it's a necessary evil to protect society, the worst, worst terrorists. And, and clearly, a lot of people were innocent, but did you actually meet someone who, who fits that image? Let me tell you one thing. Before we move to Guantanamo and 9 11, let us go back a little, you know, to understand 9 11 and Guantanamo and the war on terror, our war of terror, whatever. We need to go back. To understand, like to look back in our in history, what happened, why 9 11 happened in the first place, and was it like Muslims, all Muslims, like agree to it? So basically, you if you look and then if you go back to the 1980s, where United States were involved in Afghanistan since the 1980s, they supported uh, Mujahideen, Afghan fighters, people who come to fight against the Soviet Union from many countries, and those. Mujahideen leaders and commanders were hosted in the White House and they were called, you know, the heroes, the freedom fighters, because those men were fighting a proxy war against the Soviet Union for Americans. Americans supported with weapon, information, money, medicine, everything. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, what happened there? You know, those people were no longer needed. And they become a problem because even those 
groups where they have their own agenda, like some groups who uh, uh, in Afghanistan, like Al Qaeda or others, they they have their own agenda and they have they have their own ambition. Like if we could defeat the Soviet Union, why not defeating the tyrant in our countries? Because Saudi, you have tyrant in Saudi, you have a tyrant in every Arab country is a tyrant, literally tyrants. So it become like a way we need to resist. So the born of the resistance would come from the society, it, like influenced by the culture, by the religion, the tradition and everything. It doesn't matter what come like from the Japan, from uh, India, from Yemen, from Arab countries. So those, those men found themselves, okay, we need to start fight against those regimes. And there was like some groups from Saudi Arabia, Egyptian group, Algerian group in Afghanistan. But none of them were interested to fight against uh, Americans. Al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, this is what's his agenda to fight against the United States. After he, he went to Sudan, it's a long story. So in the 1990s, the civil war, the civil war broke in Afghanistan after, after the withdrawal of the Soviet Union. It became a civil war. Taliban came and took over. Osama bin Laden went to Sudan. Then he went to back to, to Afghanistan again. He started Again, he reactivated Al-Qaeda again and started, you know, uh, attacking the United States. One man again at one state, basically. And when you look in the, in the 1990s, there was some vacuum in the media. So it got a lot of attention and, you know, the scale of the attack, like in, in Africa, in, Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, the retaliation from Americans, like uh, uh, bombing Sudan, bombing, uh, sending missiles to Afghanistan, then the biggest thing was also the uh, attack in the U.S. is called in Yemen. And how things start escalating. From that point, you know, the, after the U.S. is called, Saudi Bin Laden also was preparing for something big. But if you go back a little, 9-11, the first 9-11 happened in the 1992, 1993, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the same person, he was also with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, went to the United States with the small group, and they tried to attack, to bring down the Twin Towers with cars the first time. But the, the, the cars, which were loaded with explosives, didn't explode completely, so they just damaged the building. So 9-11 started at that time. So it has been conflict for way longer than we actually imagined. Yes. And the exactly. majority so, of the people there you know, yes. have a way of a more complicated history behind that. Okay. that is, and we yeah. recommend so, everyone to read your book, which covers uh, parts of this as well. Um, so let, let me finish this story, Phil. So yeah. when you go back to 9-11, 9-11 actually happened in the first time, in the 19, early in the 1990s. The same person managed to flee the United States, and he started again now, try to find a way to attack United States again, but at that time, with airplanes. So... When I like research the case, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, before he came to Al Qaeda, he went to uh, Iran. Like he proposed to him his idea if they, he, because he needs some support. Then Iran refused. Then he went to Hezbollah. Then he went to Taliban. He went to some other groups. But none of them were interested to attack the United States because, I mean, like such scale of attack that will be devastating. At the same time, they didn't have like, why we, we would attack Americans? So he went to Al-Qaeda the first time, Al-Qaeda refused. Second time, they agreed to some extent. So basically, Al-Qaeda supported with men and finance. See the idea of the idea. Then, not even happen. Not even happen because it's the failure of American foreign policy. At the same time, and my, like, I believe that is to some extent that there is some kind of part in the United States, maybe in the deep state, they wanted not even to happen to, because it served their own interests. 9-11 happened, then after 9-11 was a turning point, the, when the United States misused and abused 9-11, how things went wrong, you know. After that, you all know the story that invading Afghanistan, Iraq, military expansion, drone attacks, kidnapping people, uh, black side, torture, Guantanamo, and, you know, oppressing minorities, and so on too, until that day. Yeah, and you as this 19-year-old, were a victim of this, and uh, while well, we have been speaking, we've been displaying uh, multiple pieces of art on the screen next to us and we would actually like to talk about that because uh, in your book it surprises how much art and imagination still 
played a role in, in your life in prison and also in that of the other prisoners. Um, how did your life change when the Obama administration allowed art classes in 2010? Okay, so Norwegian, I'm not to Guantanamo. Like, Guantanamo, as I told you, uh, around 800 men arrived there or taken to Guantanamo, kidnapped to Guantanamo. 50 nationalities, over 20 languages spoken, different mindset, different culture. From that, you know, we had no connection, we had no shared life before Guantanamo. We had no connection to each other. We are all Muslims, we share like the faith, but there's a lot of cultures, you know, the boundaries, uh, language, and, and so on. Which, you know, like when you're being in Guantanamo, you're confused, scared, afraid. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Why? Until one go and stay. Nobody tell you anything. Nobody tell you anything. And what I have done, all you know that with the orange car, you're going to be executed. So what do you, you would, we try to live our life, the same life we do every single day, like eating, try to communicate with people, praying, try to, try to survive, basically. Were you allowed to, to make art from the beginning? From the beginning, you know, like when we started, we were not allowed to talk, we were not allowed to even to look at the guards, we were not allowed to pray, we were not allowed to stand. Everything we were not allowed. Spread like about control. There was no rules, there was no any kind of regulation because Guantanamo is a place out created out outside of the justice system, outside of the law, outside of the humanity. Because a normal prison, there is like every prison have the construction, uh, the structure of imprisonment. You know, the staff, the walls. Uh, you know, there is like regulation and so on, but Guantanamo uh, controlled by the military, soldiers who train to be killers, and they view you as that terrorist and monster, and the one who just killed 3,000 Americans. So there was a lot of hate and grudge and uh, uh, a desire to, for revenge. Is that so, why the, the guards change so often? Um, the guards, yes, this is one of the things that changed the guards because if you look at Guantanamo also, I don't want to like, before, I don't want to like go for, uh, away from uh, to, uh, talking about art. Guantanamo was uh, a human lab. Oh, there is a research, I think I sent you the link called uh, Guantanamo America's Battle Lab. How Guantanamo turned to be a human lab experimenting on prisoners to develop uh, interrogation technique, to train interrogators, soldiers, and to study the kind, what kind of enemies the military will face because it's, it's what the perfect place there is no restriction there is no law there is nothing you have all kind of mindset of muslims different age the youngest detainee was a few months old maybe you'd be surprised that all this was 105 years old different camps different different uh, rules so <laughs> we started you know like try to understand what's going on there and the boundary language like and we didn't know much about Americans. So we started, you know, about art. We started, like, try to write in style forms or using the tea powder, like, because they get, like, tea powder in the military meals called uh, MRE. MRE. So you would draw, people draw, like, the sun, the hearts, stars, trees. People try to learn the language or try, you know, try some people try to uh, write some poems or songs or try to learn like other language from other prisoners. So because you are deprived of everything, you have nothing, nothing, and everything can be taken from you at any moment. We start also singing, like in different languages, different countries, and, and so on, and poetry, and you know, there are different culture. Of from different countries and part of the world, the language interacted and melted. And after years, I remember when we like when when we moved from Camp Axtray to Camp Delta with like 48 prisoners in one block. And you could one night we had like uh, to celebrate or like to have like every every block they have like one hour, two hours every week just to take away your mind or that place feeling being in jail and just try to escape that feeling. So and also a way to unite yourselves with your fellow detainees and to preserve because, your dignity. Yeah, because it, it was hardship, because it's interrogation. Uh, you move from interrogation from FBI, uh, CIA, and you move like uh, NSA, then you have like military intelligence, they have like all kind of just interrogation after interrogation. So also, there was like young prisoners, and you try to keep everyone like 
among ourselves try to keep everyone like uh, motivated everyone like it's not good. just everything will be okay and so and, uh, Trump banned this art from leaving the prison why were they so afraid to, to show of these pictures yeah so basically the art started uh, painting started 2010 when the Obama came to administration and after the, we were in hunger strike fighting for years for, and hunger strike and forced feeding it was like on forced feeding for three years before Obama came, the camp administration refused to sit with us. They said, we're not to be sharing with terrorists. When Obama came, he tried to send a new message. We torture some folks. Just, we just torture them a little. We torture them a little. So we sat with them. Then we start said, you know, they, they told us the camp is going to be closed in one year. And so we didn't trust you. We didn't believe you. And if you have one year here, one hour, you have to change the, the situation. So we start negotiating with them about improving the living condition, the camps, about family phone calls, about our release, about the classes, about food, about uh, medical uh, treatment, about everything, basically. One of the things was like art classes. And they said, your guys, as a terrorist, you don't know how to paint. From there, we start painting. We have like art teacher and we start producing art. It was, it was, it was one of the most important uh, think we have done at Guantanamo to have the art the art class and make an art at Guantanamo. Yeah. Everything was fine, like because art meant to us like survival, meant to connect us to ourselves, to the world, to your memories, to everything. So in 2013, the army came back and they destroyed everything. We had to fight back again and again we had to go on hunger strike and again for the right the right. And at that time Obama came and they started the periodic review board. And we were allowed to send our artwork to our lawyers, to our families. When I was when in 2016, I talked to my lawyer. I said, can we create an exhibition for art from Guantanamo? She said, OK, let me see. We contacted the, the lovely woman, Erin Thompson. She is a professor at John Jay uh, College. And she said she talked to my lawyer and said, yeah, why not? So from that, we take we took it from there. We started organizing for art from Guantanamo uh, at, uh, uh, John Jay College in New York. After the exhibition, the government reacted. In, you know, like they said, they you know they said they going to burn the 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 Pentagon spokesman. He said they would burn art from, art from Guantanamo. The art belonged to the to the government. And there was like some uh, um, some Americans they were like they weren't happy about exhibiting art from Guantanamo. They said those people are terrorists. So then at that in 2017, as you know that. The president of the United States was Trump administration, so they ban art from leaving Guantanamo. Why? Why? Because art humanized Guantanamo and humanized the prisoners uh, at Guantanamo. And the American, that means when you look at the paintings, you didn't see bombs or blood or because that was the that Adams felt. He said Guantanamo hold the worst of the worst terrorist implied, basically. So, and at the same time. You know, they, uh, they don't want anything to contradict the narrative. Yeah. So since 2017, as usually like last week, we published a letter. We sent a letter uh, to President Biden about releasing art from Guantanamo. We have been fighting for the last five years, trying to get art from Guantanamo released. I sent a letter to uh, the Bar Department of Defense. We contacted the State Department. Then I start working on the uh, open letter to Mr. to President Biden to to uh, release art from Guantanamo, and I believe that art it's a life necessity because art connects us to ourselves to our memories. It helps us. It was a way of resisting our uh, resisting our imprisonment. It was a way to preserve our humanity ourselves. It was a way to escape of the detention when you paint. It was a way of therapy. It was art meant a lot to us uh, at, at Guantanamo. And I hope we will manage to free all the art from Guantanamo. And we noticed that because you wrote that the people who suffered the most and the people who resisted the most were also the ones that were most dedicated to creating art. And why were these people especially so determined on making these paintings? You know, Art at Guantanamo at the beginning, we didn't have like, we didn't have any kind of you know agenda to make art. It was just to express ourselves, try to learn something, try to also to uh, you know because imagine you are imprisoned imprisoned in solitary confinement for nine or ten years. 
you can see the sun you, or do you see the world and the green tarps is that why you drew this so much you see a lot of pictures of the sea yeah so basically when when we started getting art we start painting the things we most most you can see seas skies stars the sea which means a lot to the sea everyone could do the sea because it means freedom it means especially when we look at the sea from that place it just takes away all your pain all your you know uh the, the burden you feel on your on your, on your chest you also read about windows <laughs> yes <laughs> so basically because we didn't have any windows in our cells and now art become your escape from the li the life you live in yeah because when you when you paint you see yourself in your paintings and it it actually connects you to your memories because here's the thing when you're in prison in a place like Guantanamo or in prison let me put it that way what makes you as a person as a person Luis and Rafiqa however what well, as a unique person like those traits which is your memories your name your knowledge your experience your emotions your uh, name your language your relationship that makes you as a person a person if we take your memories you become a shell if you take your knowledge your experience this someone tip your balance at guantanamo when you arrive at guantanamo or in a prison you just start we started constructing a new life and new memories a new relationship and new emotions a new knowledge no knowledge at all but uh, like it's your uh, environment so Mansoor we see all these pictures behind you on the wall how is your life as a, an artist now you're out of prison oh my behind me is my uh, life after Guantanamo book which is that? yeah this is my next book life after uh, Guantanamo which actually another story and because the story hasn't ended yet so basically that that way i'm trying to like to bring awareness to uh, about guantanamo and to bring the reality and the truth about guantanamo because guantanamo now becomes simple of torture oppression injustice lawlessness abuse of power indefinite detention guantanamo become become an idea it's not about prisoners anymore it's not about it's about them but it's it's not just about guantanamo itself it's the idea behind guantanamo like torturing kidnapping and prison people indefinitely in prison people and now we are fighting especially i'm gonna say i'm trying like we are fighting for the closure of guantanamo it's about us all as humans and i'm not saying that guantanamo everyone were innocent or everyone was guilty we were fighting even at guantanamo we were fighting for justice we said look guys if we have committed any crime please try us before your justice system before american justice system and if we have done something wrong you believe that try us and give us time similar as that even if even if it death sentence in your in your uh, justice system that's fine with us even american themselves you know they contradict themselves you know because they are the one who abused their own justice system their and misuse it that's what happened now like for last 20 now almost like 21 years will be like in a few months in, in two months and a half and guantanamo hasn't seen any justice 9 11 victims haven't seen any justice so do you think guantanamo will close during uh biden's presence yeah we will close guantanamo we'll keep the fight until we close the the black hole guantanamo whether america like it or not we are going to close it because this is what we're doing here so all you guys need your help to close guantanamo we will close guantanamo together you know they're gonna because, fight till it's done yeah it is i'm like we we will close them like and I, i'm trying as much as we can because alhamdulillah i just finished like last week I had like a bike ride for 400 kilometers to bring awareness. Now I'm organizing another big campaign. You will hear about it soon, inshallah, for the 21 anniversary of Guantanamo. I'm not gonna say anything, but I'm organizing this campaign. And yeah, I work with Cage as Guantanamo project coordinator. That way, I join Cage. So we can like, I need to find someone who can sponsor my ideas, help me to fight for the closure of Guantanamo. But not every prisoner have able to fight for the closure of Guantanamo because there, there are many restrictions there's a lot of sacrifice they have to make and have to, and I will make because it's a good fight, fight I think and before we continue to the last part of this interview we really want to open up the floor for some audience questions um to see okay. you can see the audience right now but believe me there are enough people here so if there's anyone who wants to ask a question I see the girl in the red sweater Leo. Send me photos of the, uh, of the people there, please. Sorry? 
I need some photos. It's, uh, I am very bad at estimating numbers. It's the microphone will be brought to the girl, I think, in a minute, as soon as the microphone issues are resolved. Leah, the girl in pink. Oh, yeah, we maybe can. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. Oh, mashallah. It's a lot of people. Hey, guys, nice to see you all. <laughs> Love you all. Thank you so much for coming today. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I saw the movie The Mauritanian a year ago, and it's, uh, yeah, it's the, basically about the conditions in Guantanamo Bay. And, it's after the, the real story of Mohammed, I think was his name. Um, do you know him and have you seen the movie? Uh, Mohammed, I met him at Guantanamo when he was like skinny and young guy. I was really like, at that time I was like 19 years old. He lives in the Netherlands. Yeah. Yes, he's, we are communicating almost like daily texting and sometimes have phone calls. Yeah, he's living with you there. You're uh, friends, uh, right? Huh? Yeah, we are friends, yes. I mean... So we 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 together to go to Namo. So yeah, I mean, um, thanks to Muhammad and his effort, he wrote like diary, uh, Guantanamo diary, and the movie, and and so on. And also, now we are developing a TV show about uh, Guantanamo. It will it will bring you know people inside Guantanamo, the life within the the detention about the the prisoners, how they live their life, how they interact with with each other, with the administration, how they grow up at that place, because we spent almost like 15 years, some of us like 20 years, and we need to bring like the kind of TV show that bring people into the, inside the, 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 the secret, uh, most expensive uh, prison in the world. But also there were difficulties because, you know, no one wants to sponsor some kind of TV show that make America look bad. It's not our intention, honestly, to make America look good, bad. It's just a truth about that place. But Guantanamo itself, it's like staying in American history. And they tried, as you know, like, secretive play. They don't want anything to be said. And like, about still until that day, you know, one of the most secretive place on the planet. And most expensive, too. Well, let's hope this is. Yes. Um, maybe one more question. Girl in the yellow shirt over there. There's a uh, microphone being brought to you. Turn the camera. Thank I'll you. Turn the camera um, well, you're a person who seems in very high spirits considering your experiences. <laughs> and I was wondering how it has affected your ability to make and maintain personal relationships. Uh, relationship with whom? With whom? With myself, with my family, with my friends, with, with who? Yeah, with your, yeah, exactly, with your friends, your family. You know, here's the thing, at Guantanamo, people used to tell me, like, especially the ICRC psychologist, and uh, I said, oh, when you love Guantanamo, when you hear the name, for, for one, you'll be like, oh, shock, or if they see the orange color, you'll be like, oh, Guantanamo. I said, nope. <laughs> I'm not kind of live Guantanamo to change me, first. But secondly, honestly, Guantanamo become part of my life. You know, it shaped my personality, my way of thinking, my, my way. May, may, may become part of me and my life, but Alhamdulillah, you know, when you when you when you always try to do what's right and try not to give up at any circumstances, we have our own problems. Honestly, we have some mental psychological issues to deal with because when you left Guantanamo, there was no any kind of rehabilitation or reintegration program. There wasn't any kind of like consultation. People tried to help you how you know to. To especially when you live, when you uh, being sent to a third country, different language, culture, people, no friends, no family around you, it's really hard and difficult. So with me, I look inside my head now because I'm totally isolated from around me. Not because because also the countries we were in, in there was a lot of surveillance. There was a lot of uh, people get arrested. Not talk uh, because I'm talking to the media all the time. I get like interrogated, like blah blah blah. blah. But what I learned, I'm not kind of keep silent, to be honest with you. I will never keep silent. It's like, you have to choice. Either to let me do whatever I do, I'm not doing anything wrong, or send me back to Guantanamo. Do you feel safe in Serbia? <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything can happen at any time. But for the last year, they like calm down a little. But before it was, you know, live in uncertainty because I was many times threatened to be deported from Serbia. 
they asked me not to talk to the media. Last week, last uh, month, I had a visitor from a friend, a journalist from the United States. She came just for a visit. And the Secret Service came twice. What she's doing here, why are trying to do some kind of, I said, okay, <laughs> talk to her. The Serbian Secret Service? Yeah, yeah, basically, yes. They're not happy about talking to the journalists and the media and, and so on, because it's a policing country, anyway. And you know, basically everything you do. Yeah, basically. But I mean, like, I'm not doing anything wrong. And I'm not, you know, like, here's the thing, you know, like, we, I have a cause to fight, to fight for what, fight for justice, fight for the closure of Guantanamo, fight, fight for, make sure that not anyone else would go through what we have been through, regardless about the background, the color, the religion, the race, whatever, because Guantanamo can happen at any place and any, any time, and anyone could be there. And yes. it is, uh, as a victim of that place, we should fight for such thing to happen again. Well, so you, you've mentioned that re rehabilitation is, is very hard uh, and many people are suffering, but I would like to mention something. You wrote this beautiful piece in the New York Times called Taking Marriage Class at Guantanamo, and I recommend everyone here to look it up. Um, I would like to ask you, you were teaching each other these, these classes and these lessons. Is there anything that you learned there from your fellow detainees that you can use now in your, your life? In Serbia? <laughs> yeah, we learn a lot, but... It's not a lot. We know a lot and, and Guantanamo scale, it was a lot. But compared to the world outside, it's nothing. What the, what the marriage class was? Who was teaching us? <laughs> the marriage class, one of the, our brothers who was married and like, we were so young, as you know, like in our culture, in a lot of countries, Muslim countries, we are like segregation between male and females. But when you grow up a little like, oh, we need to know more about getting married. So it's one of the most topics we love, talk about love and women in a good way anyway. Don't do it, guys. It's like, don't be offended. So... <laughs> Some of like, we have our marriage classes about, you know, marriage, family, family life, about, and, and so on, in, in a very uh, educational way. After Guantanamo, however, I, I tried to get married. I, I fell in love with someone and my, my, my heart got broken. I was crying for a year. So it was one of the hardest things ever in my life, like to lose someone you love. They're like, oh, I want to cry now. Anyway, so my friend has been a tough journey. And uh, yeah, that class marriage was fun there at Guantanamo. It was a lot, of, a lot of fun, a lot of jokes. But also, when I was in Guantanamo, I feel like I'm a shell. There's like, I'm, there's like missing of me there. But like, yeah, it's partner, it's a wife. Honestly, until that day. So I'm trying to find some kind of like partner or wife or because you need me like, oh God, I know how to express it. Just, I need some. <laughs> you need like this kind of uh, especially after like at that age you feel like you are unsettled you guys maybe do feel it because you have each other you have friends you have a boyfriend girlfriend you have wife married whatever but especially in my like my case totally isolated and here in serbia if you're like dark color arabs uh you are not so lucky trust me it's because... a task finding someone yeah. to share your life yeah, yeah. Yes, I hope, I hope. I, I'm not giving up in this one or two because it's one of my priorities. But at the same thing, you know, living, you know, even, even in the worst places, thinking about love, it really, it really calms us down. It really like makes you live in a different world, you know? You know, but love is not just about, just in general life, but you need to, in order to love someone, you need to know how to love yourself at first, not to, know, to experience love with yourself. Yes, um, we want to talk about one last subject before the end of this interview, which is the ability for you and your fellow detainees to practice your religion inside Guantanamo Bay. Because although this is a fundamental right for our prisoners, you weren't always granted this right. Um, and we want to know how you gained the ability to be able to pray. You know... Being a Muslim, honestly, sometimes you feel like being a Muslim is like, uh, you feel like a crime. But sometimes, like, honestly, like, because after what they call war and terror, which I call it war of terror as Muslims, and being targeted, especially as, like, minorities in some countries. And at Guantanamo, if you see that you practice your religion or that you're like, yeah, he's Al-Qaeda, or, and some people try to create some kind of, like, uh, screen that they are not like so religious and so on and because fasting and but at Guantanamo as I told you it was a place experimenting on prisoners 
So your faith would be used against you. Like try, they always, they find a way always to uh, provoke everyone when it comes to the religion, like taking the holy Muslim holy book Quran, pee on it, step on it, throw it in the toilet, genital search, strip people naked, prevent you from praying, and, and so and so on. And when that happened over and over again, you feel my religion is being targeted, you know, it's I'm targeted because who I am. That's because it's one time we try to explain, we try to find the reason why I was there, what I have done, you know, like to some extent, like, yeah, they also like, as I told you, it was also the interrogators. It was a way to, to they try, they tried many, many tactics and, uh, and, and interrogation methods and torture methods, which is to see how people react because different ages, different mindset, different nationalities, different camp, different set of, of different set of rules. It was the perfect place to experiment with prisoners. But okay. we tr we tried to resist so we can, you know, faith was important, especially in prison, that you connect to high power. Because one of the interrogators used to tell me, your file uh, on the Bosch uh, desk, you never go to know. So as a Muslim, I said, I think like, I was, at that time I was so young, I was like, this is my way of argument. Do you think uh, George W. Bush can control his asshole when he get there? And he said, no. I said, okay. If he cannot control his asshole, he cannot, he's not control my life. Basically. It's like, it's a simple <laughs> argument, stupid argument. But at the same look at it, it means I didn't care. You know, like, my faith is really sealed. It's in the hand of my, of my God. It's the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So faith was important in survival, you know. Survival in Guantanamo, it talks many things with, like, the faith, the religion, the art having each other, fighting with each other. For me, when I used to fight for my brothers, it helped me to survive because I wasn't fighting for myself. We used to fight for each other. And especially you see like young people or older people that are mistreated or mistreated, you cannot just stand, especially if you like from my background, the tribal a tribe man, and would like how you have integrity, you have courage, you have to science, like sacrifice and uh, generosity and honor and so on. And you know what I mean? As a way of protesting and as a way of fighting, you often initiated hunger strikes um, because that was basically the only thing you could do there. Did they, were they effective? Did they actually gain you more rights, more freedoms? Or was yeah. it more about making a stand? You know, like, at one time, you are dealing with military, with ar army, military, which actually, uh, their job to keep you alive regardless. That's what they used to tell us. Our job to keep, to keep you alive regardless. It doesn't matter the circumstances because life, that's what matters. So when you start, when you started the hunger strike the first time, it helped. And we found out we could do something. And we are not like keep, start fighting, you know, going physically with them. This is the last option we do because you are fighting with armed people, uh, military people, their job to fight. They will crush you. And you need to survive. So we would try as much as we can to have like a peaceful protest, try to talk the situation, try to convince them. But regardless what you do, right, what you do, they have no, they, they already have a setup of, of uh, rules and what they want to do the next. You have to react. You have to react. To God. So we start going on hunger strike. I wrote that a lot in my book, which is harming ourselves. And we spent years and years some of the prisoners spent 10 years on force feeding. I spent three years. Some of us like five years, 12 years, 13 years on force feeding. And every year we could stay like six, seven months on, on hunger strike and force feeding, try to protest, stopping the torture, the mistreatment, many, many things. And it's the same cycle. Also one of the hardest thing at Guantanamo was the routine of changing the coming administration every six months or one year. New administration, new guards, new rules, new way of running things at Guantanamo. And every time you just said, start again now. And you have to fight for the thing you have already fought before and start over and over again. Because everyone, they have their own vision and mission of running the camp. And everyone look at you as the bad person, the bad guy, the prisoner, the terrorist, wherever. And everyone think that you are Guantanamo uh, uh, for punishment. How do you, you know? keep fighting? You endure this year after year, every six months, fighting the same fight. Isn't there a point where you say, maybe if I stop and comply with what they want from me, then it will not, be better? Not everyone keep fighting, to be honest with you. Not everyone, like, because most of the prisoners 
couldn't keep the fight. Some of them just give up. Some of them become develop the way of just total surrender. Like they become just they, you know. They were in better conditions than you did because they surrendered. Uh, it's worse because you know when we used to fight, it become a way of life basically for us. It hurts. It's hard. Difficult. But we know we have to fight. Someone has to stand up. We have like a group of us. We already know what to do. We don't have to fight to keep fighting. Some of the brothers, no, because you have like some people, they can't take it no longer. And the more, the longer, <laughs> the more people, they won't give it a good life. You could get some privileges, but at the same time, it comes with a lot of humiliation and anything can be taken from you at any moment. And the interrogators, interrogations, interrogators controls, control everything, everything. So if they want something from you, you have to cooperate, cooperate with information. And sometimes they took it, they need to snatch on some people or you know, they need to tune against some people. So it was a battle. It was a way you survive, you have to fight. But but like for us, they were, even we were fighting and remember when, when we, we were fighting and going on hunger strike, we were like, used to be like, Al-Qaeda, Jihad is still fighting Guantanamo. I said, guys, you should be ashamed <laughs> by saying this. The you think they said like they called it a Jihad because they, they yes, yes, they yes. Or... Literally, they said your your hunger strike is jihad and you are trying to bring down the United States. So, and we used to argue with them. We like said, look, this is our demands. That's what we want. And if if we, if you, uh, you know, uh, meet our demands, we will stop the hunger strike. Like we did in 2010. Like there are many of us enforcing hunger strike. When we said and meet, and they have orders from the White House to improve the living condition. We stopped the hunger strike because I knew at that time that Guantanamo is not going to close in one year, because we knew Guantanamo better than anyone else. And you know, closing the detention, there is a process. There is like you can see, you could see some movement after three months. I said, brother, it's not going to be closed simply because there is no movement. There is nothing is going there, and that what happened until that day. And sir, what do you think should happen in order for Guantanamo Bay to close? You know, in order to be closed, if it needs a, a good will from the United States president to close the detention, you know, that's it. If he want to close it tomorrow, he could close it tomorrow. It's not that it's not that difficult or hard. You know, it become one time turn to become like an, an arena fight between the Democrats and the Republicans, basically. Yeah. You know, the Republicans want to show that they are tough, they are fighting against terrorism, become and then become, become like a political game. You know, close it, don't close Guantanamo. It's not about close about Guantanamo. Guantanamo is not that, you know, closing Guantanamo, it could be take, you know, there's like 36 million men there. 22 of them have been killed for release. So the rest of them, some of them are going under like plea guilty deals, military commission. What they need to do, if you were charged with a crime, they could move them to the United States, charge them with a the crime, and sentence them. The rest, if they if they know they're found guilty, they release them. Simple as that. It's not that difficult or hard. But again, it's not their priority. You know, you know, it. They, like as I told you, what we need, we need to keep fight. You know, because Guantanamo become. When you look at Guantanamo, Guantanamo become the century case. Twenty one years of injustice, uh, indefinite imprisonment, torture, abuses. Guantanamo had give, give legitimacy to other Guantanamo around the world, and many countries they have their own Guantanamo with their own set of of uh, of uh, rules and so on. So for us, we need to keep the pressure. We need to keep the media. We need to keep you know protesting. We need to keep for the closure of Guantanamo. Yeah, it's old story. It is tiring. It is, but that doesn't mean we should give up. You know, yeah. we should we should just keep insisting that, that until Guantanamo, uh, it will be closed. I believe it will be closed. Mr. Yes, we, to, we want to thank you for sharing your story with us today, um, and you are very active in helping this cause to close Guantanamo. And we've been speaking about your projects, about your book, your upcoming book, um, the other art projects going on, and as well the the bike ride to close Guantanamo. And we would like to ask everyone to have a look on your website. We will publish this on our social media. Okay, um, thank you, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. thank you so much for, for speaking to us. And we hope to see you in real life one day. Hello, one day. Welcome to Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Marla, bless you all. Hope we, 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 we will meet one day in Amsterdam, inshallah. We hope so. We want to thank the audience for being here today, too. 
If you like this interview, please also come to our other upcoming interviews. We have one the 1st of November with the previous ambassador to Afghanistan, Cecilia Weigers, and one on the 11th of November with Frans Mulder, the CEO of Ahold. Um, and for now, please give a very warm applause to Mansour, and once again, thank you so much.